ريفيو كورس وي هاف ستارتد اود ان انا ارحب بحضراتكم النهارده معانا اي وود لايك تو ويلكم اول اوف يو ان ذا سكند داي اوف ذا شولدر كورس توداي ويل بي ويز بروفيسور دكتور عمرو شوان كايرو يونيفرستي هي ويل سبيك اباوت ذا شولدر بايوميكانكس ذن انذر فيري انتريستينج توك فروم اند انفيتيشن تو جوين يو ان بامها ايديوكيشنال كورس Uh, today we will be discussing the shoulder biomechanics. Uh, as we all know, the, the shoulder biomechanics is a, a little bit um, um, a difficult topic. Uh, we will try to simplify it as far as we can. At first, if we compare uh, the shoulder joint with the hip joint, we are comparing an ice cream uh, bowl on a, a cone uh, regarding the shoulder joint. while uh, uh, in hip joint it is an uh, ice cream bowl on uh, a plastic cup. So uh, by this uh, bony configuration, this will allow the shoulder joint to have uh, movement uh, in multiple planes. And this is required for uh, the proper positioning of the hand in the space to perform uh, uh, the uh, tasks uh, in an efficient way. It is like a, a hockey ball uh, resting on uh, the wooden uh, part for its stabilization. So uh, the humeral head is rolling, sliding, and gliding on the glenoid, allowing the uh, different uh, degrees of freedom of motion, the flexion, extension, the abduction, adduction, internal rotation, external rotation, and the circumduction. The clavicle, the humerus, and the Capilla, they are all linked together through three interdependent linkages. The acromioclavicular joint, the glenohumeral joint, and the scapulothoracic joint. And finally, the functional joint, which is not an, a true joint, which is the scapulothoracic, is the remaining part of our shoulder complex. So let us remember that the shoulder complex is the glenohumeral uh, joint, the scapulothoracic, the sternoclavicular, and the chromioclavicular joint. At first, we will be talking about the shoulder stabilizers. We can divide our shoulder stabilizers into the static stabilizers, which are constant in the shape and their size, and the dynamic stabilizers, which are the 14 muscles which are controlling uh, the shoulder complex, and they actually they are the main stabilizers of the shoulder joint. These are the 14 muscles stabilizing the shoulder, eight muscles acting on the glenohumeral joint, namely the deltoid, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, the teres minor, in addition to the teres major, the pectoralis, and the tismus dorsi, and six muscles for the scapulus thoracic, the serratus, the trapezius, the pectoralis minor, the levator scapulae, rhomboidus major, and rhomboidus minor. If we talk about the static stabilizers, then we will talk about the shape of the articular surface. These are non-conforming surfaces, as to say the uh, humeral head, which is like a ball, is rolling and gliding on a flat surface, which is the glenoid. The second static stabilizer is the negative intraarticular pressure, which is allowing a suction of the articular surface in relation to each other. The third static stabilizer is the ligaments. The glenohumeral ligaments can act in one of two ways. It could be having a chikrin effect, as to, as to say that it is allowing the motion in the line of the ligament, but this motion will continue until the ligament reaches its maximum length, and then no further motion is allowed. Or a buttress effect, here the ligament is surrounding the joint like a fence, so it is preventing the motion in a direction perpendicular to the line of motion. Let's see such an explanation. This is the uh, chiprin effect of the glenohumeral ligaments as if we are having a boat which is connected to a dock through a rope. This rope will allow motion as long as it is having a sufficient length in the direction of pull of the ligament. Once it reaches its maximum length, no further motion is allowed. But this means that it will allow the, 
the, uh, the buttress, uh, it will allow the motion until it reaches its maximum effect, but it will not be capable to prevent the motion in a direction perpendicular to its line of motion, as we can see here. In the picture B and C, so if it is having a fence direction or a, or a, a buttress effect, it should be surrounding the bolt from both sides to prevent the motion in a line perpendicular to the line of the ligand. This is how the glenohumeral ligaments are acting to as a static stabilizers to provide the glenohumeral stability. While the dynamic stabilizer, the muscles, they can adjust the force apply it to the glenohumeral joint, and hence they can provide the static or the dynamic stability, which is like uh, modifying the line of pull. Like this example, if we are pulling slightly uh, on the boat, we will pull it uh, uh, at a low velocity, while if we modify our line of pull, we will be pulling the boat much more closely. These are the, uh, the, first, the, the direction of motion of the glenohumeral uh, joint in the different uh, planes, the forward elevation, the abduction, external rotation, internal rotation, the abduction and extension. And on uh, the other side of the table, these are the muscles acting on uh, the different uh, directions of the range of motion. Regarding the shoulder stabilizers, at the end range of motion, at the end of the motion of the glenohumeral joint, the capsule ligamentous structures are the main stabilizers because they became tight. While in the mid range of motion, the negative intraarticular pressure and the concavity compression effect provided by the muscles acting around the shoulder are the main stabilizers. This point is, is important because at the end range of motion, the inferior glenohumeral joint, which is part with the capsule, became tight and it prevents any further translation of the humeral head on the glenoid socket. However, if any force exceeds such a tight capsule, it will cause an avulsion of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, leading to a traumatic dislocation and a pathological dislocation will occur and treatment here is necessary. While in the mid-range of motion, the capsule is lax. It allows the humeral head to translate freely on the glenoid socket. And this what we can define as the laxity. The laxity is, is present in the mid-range of motion. And if a subluxation or a dislocation occurred without any symptoms, so no treatment is necessary. And this could be applied on examining the shoulder. The anterior and posterior drawer test, as well as the sulcus test, are performed in the mid-range of motion. That's to say, while the capsule is lax, because such this uh, tests for examination are aiming to detect the laxity of the glenohumeral joint. And, and so we can differentiate between a pathological dislocation and a physiological dislocation. The pathological dislocation is present in the end range of motion. Usually it is traumatic, usually associated with symptoms and needs treatment. While the physiological laxity is present in the mid range of motion, usually a traumatic, not associated with symptoms and will not need treatment. So the health sucks lesion is usually related to the end range uh, instability because the capsule ligamentous structures and the pancreas lesion are present. And so the tight uh, capsule ligamentous structures are not present. And so the hill sucks lesion is related to the end range. While, while in the mid range, where we are in need for the humeral head to translate on the glenoid, if there is a glenoid defect, such as an, an osseous pancreas or it's, uh, osseous bony pancreas, the glenoid effect is related to the mid-range instability. So we should train ourselves that the humor, the hill sucks lesion is related to the end range and the glenoid effect is related to the mid-range. If we discuss each 
component of the uh, shoulder complex, we will start with the sternoclavicular joint. It is a plain synovial joint. It is the only connection of uh, uh, the upper limb to the axial skeleton, composed of two saddle-shaped ends of the, the medial end of the clavicle and the nostril of the manubrium sterni. And any motion of the clavicle at the uh, sternoclavicular joint will be associated by a movement on the scapular side. It acts as a shock absorber. It, the, uh, the sternoclavicular disc is acting as a shock absorber. It is a fibrocartilaginous disc, which is dividing the joint into two parts. So in elevation and depression, it is a part of the sternum, while in the protraction and retraction, it is part of the clavicle. The, the sternoclavicular ligaments could could be divided into the fibrous capsule, the sternoclavicular ligaments, the anterior and posterior, the costoclavicular ligaments, which are divided into an anterior lamina and a posterior lamina, and finally, the interclavicular ligament. Regarding the sternoclavicular movements, there are three rotatory motions, which are described according to the clavicle in relation to the sternum. It could be an elevation depression, protraction, retraction, and anterior and posterior rotation of the clavicle. In addition to three translatory motions, which are anterior and posterior, medial and lateral, superior and inferior. Here is the elevation and depression of the clavicle. As we can see, it is occurring along the anteroposterior axis and the clavicular elevation around 50 degrees and the clavicular depression at the sternoclavicular joint is less than 15 degrees. While the protraction, retraction of the clavicle it is around 20 degrees in, 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 in both directions and it is occurring around the vertical axis. While the anterior and posterior rotation are, are occurring around the horizontal axis, the posterior rotation around 50 degrees and the anterior rotation around 10 degrees. If we proceed to the acromioclavicular joint, it is a plain synovial joint. Its function is a transmission of the forces from the upper limb to the clavicle, and it allows an additional rotation to the scapula. This joint is surrounded by a fibrous capsule, which is a, a very weak capsule. In addition to the superior acromioclavicular ligament and the inferior, inferior inferior acromioclavicular ligament, as well as the two important structures, which are the coracoclavicular ligaments, namely the trapezoid, which is lying lateral, and the conoid, which is lying medial. The trapezoid has a horizontal uh, orientation. It is uh, functioning mainly to resist the posterior forces of the clavicle, while the conoid has a vertical orientation to resist the superior and inferior forces. The disruption of these ligaments will lead to the different forms of the uh, acromioclavicular joint dislocation. Here we will see the axes around which the uh, motion at the acromioclavicular joint will occur. This is the vertical axis around which the internal and external rotation will occur. The oblique axis which around which the anterior and posterior tipping will occur and the oblique axis, which will allow the upward and downward rotation to occur. In the acromioclavicular motion, we are describing the movement of the scapula in relation to the uh, acromion. While in the sternoclavicular joint, we are describing the movement of the clavicle in relation to the, the manubrium sternum. So as we have said, we have also three rotatory motions, the internal and external rotation, the anterior and posterior tipping, the upward and downward rotation, as well as three translatory motions, anterior and posterior, medial and lateral, superior and inferior. As we can see here, this is the internal and external rotation of the glenoid fossa around the vertical axis. And here is the anterior and posterior tipping which is occurring in the oblique coronal axis, and upward and downward rotation, which are occurring around the oblique anteroposterior axis. 
if we proceed for the scapular thoracic joint, this is not a true joint. It is part of the closed chain with the sternoclavicular joint, the acromioclavicular joint, and the thorax. The linkage of uh, the scapular thoracic with the acromioclavicular joint and the sternoclavicular joint is preventing the scapular motion to occur in isolation and prevent any unnecessary translatory motions. The resting position of the scapula, it is about two inches from the midline between the second and the seventh uh, rib. It allows an internal rotation around 30 to 45 degrees from the coronal plane, the anterior tipping around 10 to 20 degrees, and the upward rotation around 10 to 20 degrees from the sagittal plane. These are the different scapular movements, the upward and downward rotations with the glenoid fossa facing upward or facing downward, the upward and downward translation, which is an elevation depression like shrugging of the shoulder, a medial and lateral translation, which is a protraction and retraction of the scapula along the chest wall, and the anterior and posterior tilt with the anterior tilt, the medial border of the scapula is moving anteriorly, when the posterior tilt, the medial border is moving posteriorly. These are the different scapular thoracic motion, elevation and depression, retraction, protraction, and the rotations. The, uh, if we are discussing the shoulder uh, forward elevation, the first 30 to 60 degrees of arm elevation is occurring at the glenohumeral joint. Any further elevation and abduction will occur at a ratio two to one between the glenohumeral joint and the scapulothoracic joint. So any associated motion occurring with the scapula will require an associated motion in the sternoclavicular and the acromioclavicular joint. Why is the scapular motion is needed? Because it will add for the shoulder movement through increasing the range of motion occurring at the shoulder joint, which is not possible to occur alone in the glenohumeral joint. The uh, rotation in coordination with the humeral head. The humeral head from pinching during the abduction of the chromium, it allows the glenoid to be, be always facing the humeral head throughout the range of motion, so it is improving the glenohumeral stability, and it allows prevent avoiding the kinking or the twisting of the rotator cuff tendons during uh, uh, motion, so they optimize the function of the rotator cuff. If we proceed for the last component of uh, the shoulder complex, which is the glenohumeral joint, our glenoid fossa is facing upwards with a six to seven degrees retroversion and the humeral head is facing medial, superior, and posteriorly regarding the humeral shaft and the humeral condyles. Here are the uh, linohumeral ligaments, which are uh, important static stabilizers, the superior, the middle, and the inferior linohumeral ligament with the anterior band and posterior band. The superior linohumeral ligament is aiming at prevention of the anterior and inferior translation with the arm in zero degree abduction, while the middle glenohumeral joint is preventing the anterior translation at 40 degrees abduction. The anterior band of the gleno inferior glenohumeral uh, ligament is preventing the anterior translation when after 45 degrees abduction and external rotation, while the posterior band in 45 degrees abduction and internal rotation. Here are the superior glenohumeral, the middle and the inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Another component of the shoulder uh, uh, biomechanics is the moment arm. What is the moment arm or the lever arm? This is the distance between the line of action of uh, the muscle and the center of rotation. The deltoid is functioning to allow abduction together with a superior or upward pull of the humeral head. This is resisted by the supraspinatus, which is allowing abduction 
but in the same time, causing a medial compression of the humeral head to fix the center of rotation of the humeral head against the glenoid. While the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, have a downward pull of the humeral head against the glenoid to resist the upward pull by the deltoid and also to keep the center of rotation of the humeral head centered on the glenoid. So the rotator cuff as a dynamic stabilizer will keep the humeral head always against the uh, glenoid to fix the center of rotation of the humeral head as well as it will prevent the upward pull of the humeral head by the deltoid. Uh, the static stabilization of the glenohumeral joint uh, while the arm is unloaded depends upon the passive tension in the rotator interval capsule, the airtight capsule, which is providing a negative intraarticular pressure causing suction on uh, the articular surfaces, as well as the glenoid inclination. This is the force of the rotator interval, and this is the two components of uh, the muscle force in uh, the force in the uh, rotator interval. But once the uh, upper limb start to be loaded, the supraspinatus will start its activity when the tension in the rotator interval became insufficient to hold the loaded arm. We will discuss uh, the deltoid effect, the rotator cuff uh, effect, the long head of biceps effect. As we can see here, regarding the deltoid, this is the deltoid resultant, as well as the uh, rotatory component. This rotatory component of uh, the deltoid force will pull the humeral head out of the glenoid, while the translatory component will have a superior translation pull on the humeral head, and uh, the resultant force of the deltoid will cause an abduction and superior translation of the humeral head. If we go for uh, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis, all of them have the same line of pull. The rotatory component will cause a compression of the humeral head against the glenoid to keep the center of rotation fixed, while the translatory component is preventing the uh, or opposing the upward pull of the deltoid on the humeral head. And finally, the resultant force will cause us the rotation and downward pull on the humeral head. If we came for the uh, supraspinatus, the rotatory component will cause compression of the humeral head against the glenoid more than the other rotator cuff muscles, while the translatory component will cause a superior translatory pull on the humeral head and the resultant finally will cause an independent abduction of the humeral head. The long head of biceps tendon, it is tightening the relatively uh, uh, loose superior labrum, and it will also transmit uh, the increased tension to the superior glenohumeral and the middle glenohumeral ligament. And so these are uh, uh, the different muscles and the dynamic stabilizers of the glenohumeral joint. The scapulohumeral rhythm depend upon the scapular uh, force couples, which are the elevators and depressors. Our main elevators are the upper trapezius, the elevator scapulae, and the rhomboidae, while the depressors are the lower trapezius, the pectoralis minor, and latissimus dorsi. And so we this is the force couple on the scapular side. Regarding the range of motion at the glenohumeral, the anatomical range of motion is variable according to the degree of retroversion of the glenoid and the degree of retroversion of the humeral head. But the functional range of motion is the minimum range of motion needed to perform the different activities of daily activity in a comfortable and an effective fashion, which is usually less than the anatomical range of motion. 
here we can see that uh, if we are considering the humeral head like a wheel and this force is acting on this wheel, it will rotate and translate this wheel. But if there is another force in an opposite direction, so this will cause the wheel to be balanced between the two forces in the opposite directions and it will rotate only or spin, but without any translation. And this is the concept of the force couple. Also, if this force is in this direction, while another force, not in the opposite direction, but in another direction, the two forces will be balanced and they will cause spinning and rotation, but without any further displacement of the humeral head or the wheel. The forces which are acting on the glenohumeral joint are the weight of the upper limb, as well as the forces generated by the muscle contractions around the shoulder, the friction between the articular surfaces, as well as the compressive and shear forces produced by the rotator cuff and deltoid acting on the glenohumeral joint. A force couple concept, we are having a horizontal force couple as well as a vertical force, uh, force couple. The horizontal is between the subscapularis anteriorly and the infraspinatus posteriorly, and the vertical couple between the deltoid and the rotator cuff tendons. As we had discussed before, the deltoid on contraction is pulling and causing abduction of the humeral head, as well as an upward pull of the humeral head from the glenoid, while the supraspinatus is causing abduction, as well as compression against the glenoid. The vertical couple is between the forces in the coronal plane, the deltoid versus the infraspinatus subscapularis and the teres minor and major. The deltoid is having an upward pull while the infraspinatus, the teres minor, teres major and subscapularis are causing a downward pull of the humeral head against the glenoid. And this is the horizontal couple between the infraspinatus posteriorly pulling the humeral head medially and posteriorly, while the subscapularis is pulling the humeral head medially and anteriorly. The concept of the force couple is important during the tears of the humeral head because if we have a vertical imbalance or a horizontal imbalance, this is important regarding the rotator cuff tears, and it is considered as one of the biomechanical aspects. Uh, for uh, the application of the reverse shoulder. This is if we are having the two force couples intact, and here if one of the two uh, limbs of the force couple had been destroyed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Amrashwan, for this interesting talk about a very difficult uh, entity which is uh, the biomechanics of the shoulder. I think it's uh, now very clear. Uh, if we have any questions to uh, Professor Am, I'm waiting for any questions. Any questions? Uh, up, till have, now, up till now, I don't have any questions. Just uh, someone is uh, making thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Amrashwan, for this interesting talk. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we will uh, proceed with uh, the next uh, talk by our dear friend, Dr. Mauricio Raffaelli from San Paulo, Brazil. Uh, may you start uh, your talk, uh, Raffaelli? Let's do it. Let's do it, Mohamed. Just yeah. a second. I would like to share my screen. Here we are. Just a second. Yes. Let's start it. I'd like to say, Dr. Amr, fantastic biomechanic uh, 